Should I just start or wait a few minutes? Uh, I, I'll, I'll introduce you, I guess. Oh, okay. I mean, um, did, has someone been in the in Gather Town actually? Can anyone, or was there a bit? But, uh... I, I, I just let people know, yes. Okay, all right, great. So yeah, let's, let's get started. Um, so it's great to have uh, Patrick Hayden, uh, um, who will tell us, uh, who will give us some lectures on quantum information. Um, I think he has some breakout rooms plans, but I'll let him explain his plans. So. Okay, well, welcome everybody. The idea of these lectures, I'm going to be giving you an introduction to quantum information, biased towards the things you're likely to, to need over the course of the next four weeks, but also including some material that you may not need, but that will be helpful to you if you try to read the quantum information literature that will be um, that could be rel ultimately be relevant to um, studying quantum information in ADS-CFT or in quantum field theory um, or elsewhere. Before we get into the actual lectures, I just want to um, do a little bit of logistics. So if you, uh, there's some material available for all of you and I'll share my screen so you can see where you can, where you'll be able to find it. Can you all see the, the TASI wiki page? Yes. Yeah, okay. So if you go to lecture pages and then to my page, uh, Introduction to Quantum Information, um, you'll see there the lecture schedule, which we'll discuss a little bit. Uh, maybe I could in just a moment. Um, a little bit of background reading. If you, um, pretty much almost everything that we're going to talk about today, you can find uh, discussed in more detail in John Preskill's lecture notes. They're free and they're great. So you just click on this course page and you can download it, everything from there. Um, and scrolling down a little bit, what we have here for each of these lectures, I'm going to be just using a tablet to lecture, um, but I've made a template. And so basically I'm going to be filling in the blanks as I go along. And so if you want to rather than taking detailed notes on everything that goes by, if you just want to do the same thing I'm doing and, uh, and fill in the blanks, then you can just download the template. And I'll make sure the template's available uh, ahead of every lecture. And then also we're gonna have breakout rooms. And during the breakout rooms, you'll be uh, working your way through a little worksheet. And so the worksheet is available for download here as well. And you'll see that I've also posted the completed worksheet. You know, this is not a, this is not a test. This is just an opportunity to uh, to chat with some other students and, and think a little bit. And so if you're stuck on something, you know, you're perfect. It's, it's permitted to take a look at, you know, at the completed worksheet and uh, uh, to get yourself over the hump. All right. Um, so the lectures are going to be broke. There are five lectures. They're, if we manage to stay on schedule, and I'm, this may be overly ambitious, so we may not get all the way to the end, but the idea is that Today's lecture is going to be devoted pretty much to the, the open systems formalism of quantum mechanics, which may not be too familiar to you. So you've probably seen density operators. We'll talk about them a little bit, but then we'll also talk about quantum channels and the formalism of measurements and also the ways that you measure distances between quantum states. Next day will be entropy, the many different forms of entropy, uh, how you calculate them, how you use them, how they're related to each other, how they're related to things that may be or may not be familiar. And then entanglement, um, mixed state entanglement, pure state entanglement. Um, lecture four will be error correction. Um, so both in sort of the approximate form that it appears in nature and the stabilizer codes that play a, a very large role in quantum computing and are also useful for toy models. And then finally, lecture five is gonna be a little bit about circuits and complexity, um, which has made, a, made an, a surprising appearance in the, um, well, in ADS-CFT over the past few years. So that's the, that's the plan. And as I said, we may not get all the way through lecture five. I think what's really important is that we get to the end of lecture four, um, because that's gonna be um, an important prerequisite to what happens in the rest of the course. Um, and so, but if you don't, don't despair, if it turns out that we, we don't make it to lecture five. Okay, I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, And now I will share a different screen, which is actually my tablet, and we'll get started on these lectures. Okay, so the, the lay of the land in quantum, inf uh, quantum information science, um, you can really think of it as being divided into the information theory part of, of quantum information. 
Oops. The, the information theory part, the, the quantum computing part. Uh, um, and then implementations. Obviously, in this course, we're not going to be talking about implementations of quantum, uh, uh, quantum computing or quantum information. But we're going to cover most of the topics on the left that I would think of as being the core of quantum information theory. So um, entropic functions like the entropy, mutual information, Renyi entropies, all these various tools that we that we use to quantify information. And I'm going to try to give you the information theorist perspective on these functions, which is usually we try to be operational. We try to think not just about defining some nice, you know, nice function with interesting properties, but a function that actually means something from the point of view of communication. Um, and so Again, just to, to orient you, you're probably aware that these uh, entropic functions have played an important role in ADS-CFT. Um, they've also played an important role in quantum field theory in terms of understanding monotones under renormalization. Uh, the ideas of communication um, and quantum uh, and error correction have also played important roles, particularly in the black hole information problem and entanglement wedge reconstruction in ADS-CFT, and then uh, more recently uh, asymptotically flat space. Um, and so. All of these things uh, are important. And finally, of course, just the notion uh, of entanglement, uh, quantifying entanglement, trying to think what is entanglement? How do you use it? How do you isolate it? Um, those are things that I'm going to introduce you to. We have less time, and it's you know, quantum computing seems to be less relevant to uh, quantum field theory, quantum gravity. But as I was saying before, complexity theory, the complexity equals action conjecture. Uh, is very interesting and is currently, you know, it, its status is, is up in the air. And so um, I will try to tell you a little bit about that at the end of the lectures. All right, so I think I already told you what today's lecture is going to be about. So let's just get into it. Um, density operators. And I'm gonna be try emphasizing an idea about density operators that you may not be, may not have thought about as, or too deeply or thought was too interesting, but which is ensemble ambiguity. But let's just start off by introducing some notation. So I'm going to say I have a density operator phi uh, on the subsystem A of a quantum system. What does that mean? Well, that could be part of a larger quantum state, say on a composite system AB. And if I trace over the B degrees of freedom of this, uh, this projector uh, associated with the pure state phi, um, then I get this reduced density operator. And yeah, I, I'll acknowledge here, this is an abusive notation. I'm using phi in two different ways. Phi is both the projector here and the density operator. And if I, and so if I have a projector and I strip off the, uh, the ket symbol, then what I mean is the density operator associated with that projector. And I'll probably do that from time to time. So this notion of partial trace it's just the trace that you're familiar with. It really is just, you know, you, you apply the trace, you know, the sum uh, over diagonal entries, but for a subsystem. Um, and so explicitly, just, you know, if you ever actually need to calculate something, I'll just write it out. So the trace over the B degrees of freedom of some matrix entry, so the ij matrix entry on the A system and the KL matrix entry on the B system, well, what you do is you take the trace over B and taking the trace over B ends up just giving you the inner product of these K and L states. So this is the IJ matrix entry on the A system rescaled by this inner product like that. And so that's the, uh, there's more to, you know, you can say more about calculating with a partial trace, but at least in principle that, you know, that's everything you need to know if you want to, if you want to do calculations. Um, so why are density operators useful? Well, they're useful because they, they tell us everything there is to know about the quantum state with respect to that subsystem, in the sense that if we have an observable, which is only on the A subsystem, and we want to calculate the expectation value uh, for the quantum state phi, the ket, um, what we do is we write down the observable. But of course, it's, a, it's really, um, in terms of the composite system, it's observable. It's the A, it's O on the A system and nothing on the B system. So tensor with the identity. And then we write down our quantum state. And this is how quantum mechanics works, right? This is the expectation value of the observable O tensor I. Um, but 
we can take, we can use that partial trace over the B system to rewrite this as the trace over uh, phi A OA, right? So um, as promised, um, the density operator, uh, the reduced density operator, the density operator on the system A um, is all the information that we need in order to evaluate the expectation value of any observable on subsystem A. And so everything else is superfluous um, if we're only gonna be talking about the subsystem. And so this can be about both an economical uh, device you know, for, for just doing quantum mechanics, but also um, it leads to some interesting conceptual developments as we'll, as we'll see. So what are the properties of density operators? Um, well, they are positive semi-definite. So I'll write that as rho is greater than or equal to zero, by, by which I mean the eigenvalues of rho are greater than or equal to zero, not the matrix entries. Um, and that follows from the, the fact that the original state, um, the projector on the AB system was itself uh, positive semi-definite. And then the trace of rho is equal to one. And that just tell you, tells you that when you perform any measurement, um, the probabilities of the different outcomes have to sum to one. And so that's why the trace of rho has to be equal to one. Okay, so that's the, uh, you've probably seen those things before, but I'll pause. Uh, at any point, if someone has a question, you can just uh, raise your hand. I'll have the participant window open here. And I think uh, other people will keep, be keeping an eye on things to make sure that uh, I don't miss questions. But um, does anyone have any, anything they wanna ask about density operators before we move on? No? Okay. Um, right, so it is useful um, to have this picture in mind if you haven't seen it, which is called the block sphere. And this only works for qubits, but it, it nonetheless, it gives you some good intuition. So we can parameterize uh, the density operators associated with a qubit um, in the following way. So the coefficient of the identity matrix has to be a half because the trace has to be equal to one. And then there's traceless stuff. And the Pauli operators form a basis um, for the uh, Hermitian traceless matrices. So we can just dot in a real valued vector R um, and get a, an arbitrary Hermitian matrix of trace one. And it turns out that the condition of being positive semi-definite just uh, is the condition that this vector R has to have length less than or equal to one. And so the density operators um, correspond to points inside the unit ball. And the surface of the unit ball is the rank, consists of the rank one states. So the states where their rank is equal to one. And we call those the pure states because those are, those are kets. Those are, uh, those are single, um, well, rank one quantum states that can be represented by vectors. This is a, um, a three-dimensional state space, you know, three, three real dimensions, and, and the unitary transformations on row act on this space, and so they have to act by rotations, and so the unitaries act by rotations. There's a privileged point, which is the point that doesn't change, uh, and that has to be proportional to the identity matrix. And so the point that doesn't change is this, is the origin, and that's the, um, the what we call the maximally mixed state, the state um, whose eigenvalues are both a half. Um, I, I guess I should have pointed out um, that the axes here, I forget, I forgot to mention that, the axes are the expectation values of sigma y, or sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z, which are also just the coefficients, pretty much, uh, up to a factor of a half of these, uh, uh, of the vector r. And I think that gives you the block sphere. Um, now, the thing that I find particularly interesting, or one thing that I find interesting about this, uh, this, this picture is that it allows us to think about the ensembles of pure states that can represent a given, uh, a given mixed state. Um, and I guess I, I didn't emphasize this point, but you can take convex combinations of density operators. So if I have rho and sigma, then uh, lambda rho, plus one minus lambda sigma is also a density operator. 
Um, it's also trace one. If you have know, lambda is a, a real value uh, between zero and one, then this, this corresponds to statistically you know, with probability lambda being rho and probability one minus lambda being sigma. And so there's a convex structure to the set of density operators. And that corresponds to the different ways that you can decompose a given density operator into other states. And so the maximally mixed state, for example, can be decomposed as an equal mixture, so probability a half, probability a half, of the plus one and minus one eigenstates of sigma z, the spin up and spin down states, right? But of course, we can also decompose it as an equal mixture, probability a half, of the eigenstates of sigma y. And for that matter, we could even decompose it. Oops. Uh, we could uh, even decompose it as the uh, the uniform distribution over this uh, this equator of the sphere corresponding to the the yz plane um, of those of those quantum states. And given any uh, any density operator which is not pure, there's a continuum of different ways that you can decompose it into ensembles, into different pure states that, that have the same density operator. Um, and that is actually the reason that uh, some forms of quantum cryptography work, um, that you can fool an, or you, that an adversary, uh, even though you're, you're working with different quantum states that are produced in different ways, the adversary can't tell them apart. It might correspond to this kind of situation right here. Uh, density operators that are indistinguishable, but underlying ensembles in some protocol that are not from the point of view of the, uh, you know, the participants who are trying to execute the protocol. Um, and if you don't think this is interesting, um, you should contrast this with the classical situation. So here, let's think of a, a, a classical random variable um, that can take values zero, one, or two. Okay, and so the the prob the the different po possible probability distributions um, are points in the simplex, right? This this plane, um, and I've written the I've drawn the triangle in the plane. The that the sums of the probabilities have to add to one. Uh, and of course, the probabilities have to be non-negative. And if you choose any any point, there's a un uh, in that simplex. There's a unique way to decompose it. Like that. Um, and so pro probability distributions in quantum states, in, in this sense, are very different from each other. That uh, probability distributions, give, you know, given some probability distribution, there's always a unique way to decompose it in terms of the extreme states, the ones that where there's, you know, the, uh, there's a, a delta probability mass. Um, but with quantum states, there's always an infinite number of ways of decomposing them. Um, and that that is actually the source, you know, the underlying uh, reason for a number of interesting properties uh, of quantum information. And you're going to you're going to work through one of the interesting uh, one of the interesting consequences in your worksheet. And I'll pause here for for questions again to see if anyone has anyone they, anything they want to ask me about. Oh, uh, yes. So Anandita. Thank you for the question. So first of all, why do we care about qubits in C2 and not high dimensional spheres? And secondly, Instead of polymetrizes, if we choose any other basis, is it possible to get the density operators continuously transitioning between pure states and mixed states? Okay, so for the first question, we don't particularly care about qubits. Um, qubits are just a useful uh, a useful starting point, right? So this this that this picture can give you give you some intuition um, for the structure of the space of the space of states. Um, in higher dimensions, it's more complicated uh, um, that the, you know, the, condi the, the condition of positivity is um, you know, not as simple as just you know, um, placing you inside the unit ball of some sphere. The, the exposed points of this convex set um, are the density operators of submaximal rank. And so um, you, you have some, some more interesting structure for those expo exposed points. They're not, they're not all extreme. Uh, right, because a, a rank two density operator in dimension three is a, it could be a, is a convex combination of uh, two rank one density operators. Um, 
but it's still it, this picture. It, it turns out it, it's still it, it, it's very it's good for intuition. Like we are we we are ultimately interested in you know, systems of extremely high dimension for the most part when we're thinking about quantum field theory or quantum gravity. Um, but and low dimensions can be misleading in some circumstances. And yeah, you know, later on in the course, I'll I'll give you some examples of that. But it's yeah, it, it's worth uh, it's worth looking at. Um, I'm sorry. Can you remind me of the second question? Yes, sure. So, is the choice oh. of the uh, basis vectors Pauli choices unique, or we can start with any basis vectors and we can have the same property density operators on pure state, making a transition into density operators over mixed states? Um, so, the the base the choice of basis is not that special, but what this really is is the the adjoint representation of SU two is what is what you're what you're looking at here, like that, you know, you're acting by conjugation on the Hermitian matrices. Um, you have two by two Hermitian matrices, and that's a three-dimensional uh, three-dimensional vector space. So the choice of basis doesn't really matter a whole lot. It's just to, you know, to be concrete. That makes sense. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. OK. So that's it for yeah, the, the very brief in, yeah, introduction, if you haven't seen them, to, to density matrices. Um, now I want to talk about transformations of states. Um, so this includes the, you know, the time evolution of quantum mechanics, but it might, uh, it, you know, it might include stuff that uh, it, yeah, goes beyond our usual notions of time evolution. And so we're going to be talking about quantum channels and then quantum measurements. So classically, there's this notion of a noisy channel which is supposed to capture anything that can happen you know, out there in the world, you know, given some uh, classical system coming in in some well-defined state producing a classical system in a well-defined output state. And you know, the, the model that you, know, that you might have is there's an X coming in, there's a Y coming out. So here time is going to the right. Um, I'm, time is going to the right in these lectures just because that's the convention in quantum information. But for the, imagine, imagine for most of the other lectures uh, in the course, time will be going you know, from bottom to top. Um, so what could you do? Well, y could be a function of x, right? That you know, the system could deterministically produce some y for, for an x. But it's also convenient and a good, you know, useful model to think of y being stochastically produced from x. You know, that there's a, you know, when x comes in, uh, y is produced some, with some probability p of y given x. And We'd like to know what, what is the sort of the quantum analog of some transformation on these density operators um, that, that could be a noisy transformation, it could be noiseless, you know, that just kind of captures anything that might, ha might happen out there in the world. And that's going to be our notion of a, a quantum channel. Um, I'll, I'll sell it. Yeah, I'll, I put noisy in parentheses because it need not be noisy, but it's the quantum noisy channel. And it may not be obvious, it's, it's, it's not really obvious at first how we should define these things. And so maybe we should just start off with an example. So let's try an example. And our example will be that there's a density operator coming in. And what, you know, where does noise come from in physics? Well, our quantum system that comes in might interact with um, some other system, an environment, for example. And we could just for good measure, or not for good measure, but kind of without loss of generality, oops. Just imagine that the this other system begins in a pure state. If it's not in a pure state, um, then we could always just imagine that we're interacting with some part of a larger system that is itself in a pure state. Um, so there's some interaction. That happens all the time in physics. Um, and where does the noise come from? The noise comes from the fact that we discard part of the system. All right? And let's call the part that we keep, n of rho, so script n for noise. Um, and this is certainly, you know, this is a, a, well, a physically well-motivated picture for what might happen out there in the world. You know, so be some, you know, and whatever notion of noisy channel we come up with should at least capture this as a, as a special case. And I'm going to label the subsystems just for uh, future reference. So the, we'll call the input A, the output B. And it might be, you know, the same Hilbert space. So A, A and B are our Hilbert spaces here. Um, but they could be different, right? Like maybe um, you discarded so much that there was very little left in B at the end of the day. We'll call the part we discarded E for the environment. And then I'll use F again, just because E and F may not be the same if uh, A and B are not the same. So there's an example of something that could happen. And let's just do a little calculation um, just to try to 
get a feel for what this does. And the reason this is this can sometimes be an inconvenient picture is just that in this picture, we're explicitly describing the entire environment, right? If you imagine you might have a, a, a small system you know, interacting, you know, I don't know, you know, maybe as a quantum information person, I might have a qubit that I've tried to build uh, and it's it's interacting potentially with all the the degrees of maybe it's a solid state state qubit all the degrees of freedom in the, in the chip and in the dilution fridge and everything else around it uh, and you don't want to, you often don't want to have to explicitly model those we like some intrinsic description that doesn't actually explicitly mention ENF so let's see if we can get rid of ENF this envi these environmental degrees of freedom so what we're doing here is we're taking the trace over E and there's a unitary acting on the input density operators. Like that. Um, and let's just write out that trace explicitly. Remember, the tra evaluating the trace, it doesn't matter which basis you use. So I'm just going to choose some basis. And I'm going to make it an orthonormal basis of the environment. Um, like that. And what we can do at this point, um, if, you, if you look here, um, the matrix U has four indices, right? It has the A and F input indices, and it has the B and the A and F input indices and the B and F output indices, or B and E, I should say. And we've actually fixed two of those indices, right? So we had the matrix U, we fixed the E index, and we've fixed the F index. Um, and so what's left, you know, we're looking at a submatrix of U, which is actually just uh, a matrix on A and B. And so I can write this as a sum over J, NJ row, NJ dagger, um, where NJ is the matrix I get by fixing the E and F indices um, as, so, as so on, uh, on U. And What's important about this is now these matrices N J. They're just you know they're just matrices. They're not necessarily unitary or Hermitian or anything. They're just matrices. Uh, but they map the Hilbert space A to the Hilbert space B, as a, as desired, with no reference whatsoever to these environmental degrees of freedom. And so this is now a more intrinsic uh, description of the time evolution. Um, and we might ask at this point, okay, well, are, what kinds of NJs are allowed? What conditions might exist on them? Um, and the one thing, one thing we know about the time evolution is it has to preserve the trace. So the output has to have unit trace. Um, and let's just see what that means. So the trace of N of rho, so what is N of rho? N of rho is this quantity here. So the trace of the sum over j of these nj's acting on rho has to be equal to one. And of course, the, the, the trace is cyclic, so we can move the right operator around to the left. Um, and what we get is that the trace of sum over j nj dagger nj times rho has to be equal to one. And this condition has to be satisfied for all rho. So can anyone tell me what does that tell us about the sum over j nj dagger nj? Like we now have some non-trivial condition. Yeah, they, it has to be the identity. The, the only uh, the only observable that has expectation value of one for all states is the identity observable. Um, so that's the that's right. So the sum, oops, sum over j nj dagger nj has to be equal to the identity. So that's a nor that's basically a normalization condition. Um, and now you might wonder what other conditions uh, do these do these operators, the noise operator, the, the NJ operators have to satisfy? And it turns out the answer is none. This is it. Uh, and so there's, a, there's actually a beautiful theorem um, 
that captures this, no, you know, this notion of a quantum noisy channel. So let's just uh, let n be some function on density operators. Okay, so density operators. And I'm gonna give you three equivalent conditions um, on this function. So the first one is that we can write it as sum over j, nj rho, nj dagger. Oh, whoops. Right? With the nj satisfying this normalization condition that nj dagger nj sums to the identity. Okay. Uh, and this is called uh, this is called the Krauss form uh, of uh, of this map. So there's one condition, and I haven't or one uh, <laughs> one uh, characterization of uh, of possible maps. And I I haven't imposed any conditions on these nj's other than the normalization. So the second equivalent notion uh, is this one that we came to before, that we have some row coming in, and we also have some state of some environmental system, um, which we called F before. They interact unitarily, and then you trace over some E degrees of freedom. Um, and so this is actually equivalent. Um, so if there, if there exists some, uh, some Hilbert, you know, some environment systems E and F, and there exists a unitary U, uh, such that uh, you have a map that takes row to n of row of this form, that's actually equivalent to what we saw before. And what we showed is that if you have this two condition, um, you can derive one. But now we're learning we, from one, you can derive two. And actually, you, it's not very hard to derive two from one. So I'll, if you want to try it, I'll leave it as an exercise. This is called the Steinspring dilation of the channel, if you ever hear that jargon. Um, but then there's a, a third characterization, which is in many ways more satisfying. Um, and it's more abstract. And so the third one is that n is a linear map. Now, why would you want a map on density operators to be linear? Um, if you want to be able to preserve the interpretation of a density operator as, as a, a probability distribution, it should take convex, your map should take convex combinations of density operators to convex combinations with the same weights. And so that's essentially telling you that the map has to be linear if it's going to have a good interpretation in, ter uh, in terms of probability. So being linear is a, a desirable thing. And we asked that the map uh, always takes density operators to density operators. So this is a very weak condition, right? This is basically just saying, well, let's just imagine anything that could happen in the world that takes density operators to density operators. Uh, and the statement is that's actually equivalent to these two descriptions that we that I gave before. Um, condition two, which is kind of the physically motivated one, interacting with an environment. Condition one, which is convenient for open systems descriptions because you don't have to explicitly describe the environment. Uh, and condition three, which is this abstract characterization, which, uh, which just tells you that anything that you could imagine under the sun um, falls into this category with an asterisk. Um, and the asterisk is that it's not actually just n, but I have to require that the identity tensored with n always sends density operators to density operators. Um, and that doesn't come for free. And we'll see when in the, in the lecture on entanglement uh, in particular why it doesn't come for free. Uh, and it's a, it's in, in many ways, it's useful that it doesn't come for free. Um, and so this leads us to the, the characterization of the set of what we call the quantum channels as the completely positive trace preserving ma uh, linear maps. Uh, trace preserving, as we've seen, is necessary to conserve probability. Positive means you take positive semi-definite matrices to positive semi-definite, and the completely um, is referring to the fact that it it's, remains positive when we tensor with the identity. Um, and so this is what Just a quantum a channel is. Yeah. Did you have a question? Sorry. Is there any um, intuition to why do we need that um, tensor product with the identity to make this work? Um, so the um, The intuition, uh, again, you'll, we'll see this in detail in the lecture on entanglement, but there are maps like the transpose, uh, which preserves positivity. But if you act on half of an entangled quantum state, it gives you negative eigenvalues. Um, and, 
and and just and so you want to exclude those from so 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 th those those are somehow not physical um, because they they take you outside of the space of density operators. Um, and what's interesting actually is you know, this the 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 set of transformations on yeah you know, that the the set of completely positive maps has this very nice structure, right? This is this is a structure theorem for the class of completely positive maps. The class of positive maps is a mess. Like no one knows how to characterize it in any, yeah, in any detail um, or, or with any kind of completeness. So, so there's no, there are no canonical forms, there's no structure theorems, anything like that. Um, but the, you know, the, the main example to think about is, is the transpose. Um, and that, that's related to time reversal um, or you know, complex conjugation. That the, you know, the, uh, that the that these maps, um, which do play a role in physics, like CPT conjugation, also, you know, also it, you know, it, it's, it, it is a physical relevance, but it's not an actual physical evolution. Uh, and, it, and it can, if you only apply CPT conjugation to a subsystem of a quantum system, you could end up with negative eigenvalues in your density operator. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. So again, with the this is a, I like this as I was saying because you have the abstract characterization, you have the physical characterization, and then you have the characterization which is convenient to uh, for calculations. Um, all there. So let's look at a few examples again, just to get your intuition. And we'll, these will be qubit examples again, not because qubits are particularly important or special, but just because they're easy to visualize and they give you some intuition. So what we call the depolarizing channel um, is the channel. That with some probability, say one minus lambda, it does nothing. But with probability lambda, it replaces the state with the maximally mixed state. So for qubits, you know, d is equal to two here. And I'll, I'll ask you, what do you think that does to this block sphere? This this channel. Anyone have any intuition for what it might do? It uh, perhaps uh, contract the sphere to its center point, or possibly. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. So, yeah. if lambda were equal to one, then everything would go to the maximally mixed state. Um, if lambda is intermediate between zero and one, then it contracts the sphere, um, and so um, in a in an isotropic fashion. Now, type of noise. Another type of noise. Very. Uh, frequently encountered in nature is dephasing noise, which is otherwise known as de decoherence. Again, with probability lambda, one minus lambda, you do, do nothing. But with probability lambda, you flip the phases in the sigma z eigenbasis. So z is just a sigma z here. So what do you think this, again, I'll, I'll ask you, what do you think this will do to the block sphere? Any ideas? To get some intuition, you could think about what this will do to sigma x and sigma y expectation values, and, and also sigma z. Uh, okay, well, so it preserves the z direction and shrinks the other directions. That's exactly right. So, um, the this does not affect the sigma z expectation value. But it shrinks x and y um, in equal measure, and so oops. So what we'll do is something like this. The the poles will remain where they are. And so the um, we'll end up with a. Um, What's this called, anyway? An ellipsoid, I guess. Um, and then another important one, and this one actually comes up a lot if you're going to be talking about um, error correction ADS, ADS CFT, is the erasure channel. And so here, what you do again with probability one minus lambda, you do nothing. And with probability lambda, you erase the state. And so this is very similar to the depolarizing channel, right? If we go back to the depolarizing channel, we, we actually erased the information with probability lambda. 
But what's different here is that I have a special state, which I'm calling a race, which is orthogonal to the, uh, say, the qubit space. Um, and so I, what that means is I know when the erasure happened. And that actually makes this, in terms of error correction, a much easier situation to deal with. Um, that in the first case, you just you don't really know what, what happened, whereas in the second case, you, you know uh, that erasure happened. Um, so so these look very similar, but somehow this erasure noise, and we can discuss in more detail when we talk about communication, is, is much, much uh, more benign than depolarizing noise. And I should perhaps go a little bit quickly, but um, since you're physicists, we should talk uh, a little bit about the infinitesimal limit. So if we go back to the, the Krauss form right here, um, imagine that one of these NJs was very close to the identity. And so you expanded it as the, the identity plus a little bit. Now you're familiar that in, you know, conjugation infinitesimally becomes uh, a commutator. And so uh, the infinitesimal limit of that Krauss form um, it has uh, for the the non you know, for the the Krauss, for the Krauss operators that are not close to the identity. It has this piece which is just what you'd expect uh, conjugation by these noise operators. We call them jump operators. And there's also uh, let me just I always forget the order here. Yeah conjugation with the Hermitian matrix um, and minus and so expanding you know, when we the the Krauss operator that was close to the identity we took the Hermitian part uh, and we got this and we took the anti Hermitian part and we got we got this or, or, or vice versa. And then you impose the condition, uh, the normalization condition. And that's why these are uh, LJ dagger LJs. And this is what's called the, uh, the master equation. And, the, and, and what it gives you is the time evolution of a density operator under certain assumptions. And it's worth looking, you know, remembering what was the assumption under which this Krauss form worked. And the assumption going back here was that the environment started out in a state that uh, was product with the density operator. And so if this is going to be true at all instants in time, what this amounts to is saying that at each instant of time, you have a new environment. Uh, and so this is a Markovian assumption. And so this, this, uh, this master equation is valid uh, under the assumption that the correlations in the environment um, kind of uh, are reset at every step. Um, and the density operator never becomes entangled with the environment. And it, just again, a, a concrete example of this situation, you could think about a harmonic oscillator. And you, the way you damp that harmonic oscillator, the jump, you, know, you just have to introduce a jump operator, which is proportional uh, to the annihilation operator in that oscillator. And you can put a rate in front of it. And then if you, um, solve this in the Heisenberg picture rather than the Schrodinger picture, so you don't look at the time evolution of the density operator, but rather of the observable, what you'll see is the usual harmonic oscillator um, piece, which corresponds to just a circular motion in the uh, in phase space, and minus a decay. And so, as you would expect, um, you know, this is this is how you can describe a damped harmonic oscillator. Um, so the phase factor is actually, or the the, the sort of phase space factor is, is spiraling into the into the origin. And I'll pause again for questions. Anyone want to ask anything about quantum channels? I should say, you know, if you're wondering, you know, when are these things going to come up? Um, these will come up and, and play an important role when you're, and I assume that uh, in the, the lectures on quant uh, quantum information, and quantum field theory, you will be discussing uh, monotonicity in the renormalization group. Um, and so the quantum channels play an important role there. Um, and they also play a, uh, a, a role, but maybe less important role in, in the quantum error correction story in, in ADS-CFT. 
But are there other questions? I see Alec has a hand up. Okay. Go ahead. Alec. Hi. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I have a question about the third characterization of the noisy channel. Sure. So what's the space on which that identity operator acts? Ah, good question. So this is a priori. It's, you know, you have, you have to tensor with any possible Hilbert space. So it, it should be true uh, whenever you tensor with the identity. In practice, it's enough to just take it, you know, if n, is, uh, if the density operators, um, if n is acting on density operators on some Hilbert space H, it's enough to just tensor with H. Thank you. Um, and actually, if you take a single pure entangled state on that doubled Hilbert space, it's, an, it's sufficient to just check that, that, that the output of that is, is, is positive semi-definite to test this complete positivity. So is the necessary criterion that we want the dimension of that space to be, be greater or equal than um, yeah. the, like our origins? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And Anindita, you had a question? Or is that just a residual hand? Uh, no, thank you. I have a question. So the parameter lambda in, in the dephasing or eraser channel, is, is that parameter determined by something in the system? And apart from the bound between zero and one, are there any other constraints on that? Um, so yeah, the, those parameters, so these are just idealized models of noise, like, you know, the real noise that you would encounter in some system is, you know, going to likely be a, a little bit more complicated than this, uh, and, but they are just determined by the physics of the system. And yeah, uh, any lambda between zero and one, uh, is valid. You know, you, you can, you can check actually what I've, what I've written down here is almost the Krauss form. Um, and so you can just verify that they satisfy the normalization condition, and then you then you can say, okay, th these are quantum channels, um, because uh, I guess you'd also have to verify the complete positivity, but that's also again easy to check in this case. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, so those are channels, and I'd like to talk a little bit about measurement as well. Um, and you probably, you know, You've encountered measurement in quantum mechanics before. And traditionally, the way that this is discussed is using uh, saying that a measurement corresponds to a set of orthogonal projectors. So maybe they're labeled by k. So I have some pi k's. And I have you know, the condition is that the, those projectors have to sum to the identity. And that corresponds to the condition that when you actually perform the measurement, the measurement probabilities have to sum to 1. Uh, and in the, in the language of observables, um, what you would say is that uh, these, these orthogonal projectors are projectors onto the eigenspaces of your observable, right? And so this is, you know, if you've taken a quantum mechanics course once, this is probably what you, uh, what you encountered for measurements. Um, but I want to play the same game that we, we played before, um, thinking about the fact that when you actually measure a system, you bring it into contact with an apparatus, um, and, or you could interact with some larger system and you could actually perform a measurement on that larger system. Um, and then the question, it was profitable before to say, well, how could we describe such a situation without reference to the, you know, to the larger system? In this case, the one, what I'm calling E and F. Um, and let's think about the, the special case where the set of orth orthogonal projectors that I measure, um, is just, you know, the, the, measuring this orthonormal basis that I used to define the, the Krauss operators earlier. Like how, um, how do I describe this measurement only in terms of A and B? And the answer is pretty straightforward. Um, remember we had these NJ operators, which were the, the Krauss operators. Um, the outcome probabilities for this measurement are nothing other than the trace of the corresponding terms in that Krauss form of the channel, All right? So they're, it, the, the channel was a sum over J. Each, each one of those J's was a positive semi-definite operator that uh, did not have unit trace. And so its actual trace is the probability. And the state transition that occurred, um, well, rho was acted on by conjugation by the, by, the, uh, by the Krauss operator. Now, this is not normalized. And so we have to normalize it by just dividing it by, uh, by its trace. Um, and so this is the uh, the more you know, the more general way of talking about measurements. 
And the virtue is that you know, pretty obviously, if you think of measurements in these terms, you're, you're gonna be able to do things that go beyond uh, orthogonal projectors, right? Um, so how can you characterize these measurements? Well, you characterize them um, using, let's see, so I remember what I wanted to write here. Yeah. Using MJ, which is actually NJ dagger NJ. That if you look above, this probability is really the trace. Oh, maybe I'll write it out. The trace of MJ against rho. And so if you want to calculate the outcome probabilities for some measurement, all you need is to know these, uh, these MJ operators. And the conditions on them, well, um, the normalization for the channel told us that they sum to the identity. So that's the same as for orthogonal projectors. But there was no other condition on the ends. But if we look at this, this tells us that the MJ is positive semi-definite because it's basically the square of the N. So MJ is positive semi-definite. And so that's really how you should think about measurements. And the vocabulary, if you read a paper, such an object, a collection of MJs that sum to the identities and is positive semi-definite is called a positive operator valued measure, a POVM. Um, and it's a really nice formalism to have available to you because it allows you to make sense of you know, some situations that, that are puzzling. So imagine that we have, uh, we have light, say a single mode, the optical field, um, and we, uh, we, we aim it at a beam splitter. And for one output port of that beam splitter, Remember, light, you know, that single mode is described by a harmonic oscillator, and so there's a, an analog of position. So I measure position in one mode, uh, output of the beam splitter, and I measure momentum in the other mode, or yeah, x and yeah, the x and p operators. Now you all know that, of course, the, the Heisenberg uncertainty pr principle prevents you from simultaneously measuring x and p, but it looks like we've just figured out with a way to measure x and p by making use, you know, by uh, taking this. This light, this incoming light, and um, embedding it into some larger Hilbert space, you know, with, with two sort of two output modes, and of course that can't really be what's going on. Uh, that would, you know, or if it were, you, you would have heard about it. Um, and to really describe what's going on, we can use this POVM formalism. And so you've probably encountered coherent states before. Coherent states are displacements of the vacuum, right? So my my zero state here is the vacuum. And uh, alpha is this, this is this displacement. So I have the a daggers and the a's and the and the exponential and some coefficient alpha. Uh, alpha. And so what this amounts to is the uh, I displace in position by the real part of alpha, and I displace momentum by the imaginary part of alpha. And these coherent states, um, if you average over them, so you average over the whole complex plane or you, know, you integrate over the whole complex plane with an appropriate normalization, you get the identity operator. And each one of these, you know, so what, what is the ground state of the harmonic oscillator? It's a Gaussian in position, it's a Gaussian momentum, right, uh, of unit variance. And so each one of these alphas is, uh, is a Gaussian of unit, you know, unit variance and position momentum displaced somewhere in, in phase space. And can anyone guess what the, P the POVM that's actually implemented by this apparatus that I've described is now? I have something that sums up to the identity. Any guesses? So alpha is a substitute for position momentum. Remember, the, the real and imaginary parts of alpha are the expectation values of position momentum. So my POVM elements are just one over pi times alpha, projector onto alpha. So these, this is an overcomplete, you know, the alphas are sometimes called an overcomplete basis. Uh, you know, they're, they're not orthogonal to each other, but if I, you know, if I uh, sum them up in the appropriate way, I get the identity. And so this is a noisy measurement of position momentum, which does not violate the uncertainty principle. Um, and so, and it's described in this very nice way without needing to, to talk about the additional modes. 
I'm going to skip what comes next because I want to give you time to actually, uh, you know, we can discuss this story. This is just a, um, a situation where these POVMs can do something, uh, can measure something that you might not have thought possible. Um, and you can ask me about it after the class is over. But for now, I think since we don't have too much time left, I'd like to let you go off and work on worksheet one. Um, and worksheet one is going to co combine the notions of ensemble ambiguity uh, for density operators with the, the measurement formalism a little bit. And you're going to see that there's some interesting relationship between ensemble ambiguity and, uh, well, superluminal signaling or uh, the non-existence thereof. Now, remember that to get the worksheet, you can download it from the wiki page for the course. And what I'm going to do is I'll uh, send you into breakout rooms just randomly assigned with five students per room. Before I, I tell, uh, before I send you off, though, does anyone want to ask a question? No? All right, let's make these breakout rooms. Actually, I'll make it six per room, and then we'll have about uh, 11 rooms. Um, I just put a link to the worksheet in the chat. Thank you very much. Now, I'll try to circulate among the rooms. I, I, uh, there are 11, so I may not get to everybody, but um, we have some other faculty members here. They've never seen this worksheet before, so they don't know what the answers are, but they, they might circulate as well. We'll see and, uh, and chat with you. And then if there's time, we'll come back. And if there's not time, uh, we'll just take it up at the beginning of next day. So Senaroth and, and Thomas, are you there? And Alex? So Alex, Alex, is, Alex is our host. Alex is our TA. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, okay. And and Shanta is a uh, is is a faculty member at CU, so Okay. So the, 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 they're not having difficulties joining the rooms, they're just uh, hanging out here. Yep. Okay, so the other faculty members again, you, you don't need to circulate. You're not uh, <laughs> but um, feel free to if you if you'd like to chat with the students. I'll, I'll just start um, at room one and gradually make, move, make my way up. And I think I'll give them about 15 minutes to, to think about this, which probably means that will be the end of the, the session. Um, but if they, they seem to be going through it really quickly, then I'll call them back earlier and I'll, I'll discuss it. Um, but it looks like I'll probably just start next day with a discussion of the worksheet. Okay. All right, sounds okay, good. So so then, will there be a reconvening in any case um, on Zoom, or are you sending people to Discord? Uh, not Discord to uh, the gather. Okay. Oh, maybe, maybe I'll call everyone back at least, and, you know, because then I'll, I'll I'll tell them what's happening. Mm. Um, okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. This has been great so far. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I guess we'll we'll leave the recording running and just uh, this this part will be edited out. Uh, if there's anything left at the end that needs to be posted. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. I was going to see if Patrick was here and check in with him about questions. Uh, he, I noticed he mentioned that. Uh, students should raise hands and students are obeying that. But I thought I'd maybe check with him when not everyone was listening to see how he felt about people just unmuting. Just going for it, yeah. Mm -hmm. he, I don't want to pressure him if he prefers not, but if, if he's fine with that, it's probably easier, I think. We had a lot more questions in the first two and that might be the subject, but it might also be that students feel a little easier asking if they can just go for it. I see. Mm -hmm.
I think he, he's busy circulating now, so we can we can ask him later. Yeah, I can ask him at the end. So while you guys are still here, let me just check. Uh, we can for for the last lecture for Mukun's lecture, we can just leave things on Zoom, stop recording, and that way that you know, still have the iPad or whatever he can be using that rather than trying to go to uh, gather town, right? Yeah, sure. And I, I think it was good, like the way Thomas did it. And the after Henrietta's lecture that uh, had maybe you know there were questions five ten minutes of questions and then sort of said okay let let's stop here and people can leave not make people feel like they need to stay forever but then just sort of leave it open also yeah I I stayed Dilly and Henrietta stayed for about another almost another thirty minutes oh is that right answering I, questions I, on Zoom I left so mm -hmm. awesome. so why not do it that way I mean. I mean, I asked this before, but it, it, it feels like it's it's easier to for the speakers to still use Zoom while they have their thing open and so forth. The notes to go back to and don't have to re screen share and, and mm -hmm. gather down and just terminate it just before the next um, lecture. Right. I guess so. Yeah, I definitely understand the, those points, and I see that. I guess what I'm also thinking is I'm a little worried that I don't want the students to feel like they're gonna miss something if they aren't listening to 25 minutes worth of the lecturer speaking after the lecture. I want students well, to Well, they do that anyway and got it down. Yeah. Talk in little groups. But yeah, we, we, we could experiment with leaving Zoom open more and see what people do. We, we are, we're, we're doing that for two out of four lectures already. So we, we sort of have the experiment. I guess that's true. And what is so far the upshot of your assessment? I mean, I like it this way, um, but. Yeah, I mean, it, what, 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 what we did last year was only had the one organized coffee break. And I, I believe in between lectures, we just sort of let, let people linger on Zoom. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, oh, it could wait, be that I, we'd I, get sort of better better attendance and more small group discussions at the at the afternoon coffee break if it was unique instead of trying to have three per day. But mm -hmm. I don't know. I th this is certainly one of those things that we could try both ways and then ask people what they what they think. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean I, I feel like I knew I knew what my justifications were for things, but I'm happy to experiment and, and change things around if, it's, if it seems different. I, I, I wanted to encourage students to talk to each other in groups of five or six um, and not just, so far we had people really clustered around the lect lecture. When Ashok was at Gather, every, everyone was around Ashok because there's one group of like six people who was having their own chat for a little while and that was nice. Um, mm -hmm. but. I'm willing to try slightly different things and see what seems to be working. Yeah, yeah. I think this will become better once people start knowing each other and chatting with each other and, and so forth, I guess. The, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm hoping that after a little while, people will start to have other friends they want to talk to, and, you know. So I missed, what, what is the suggestion for, for right now? Should, should I break out together? immediately after or um but let's I still let, let, let questions a few questions uh, so I, I think regardless of whether we want to have gather or not gather let's let's continue to have five to ten tops minutes of recorded questions on zoom I, yeah if mm -hmm. there are okay. um and that's what we we would do that if it was in person also but let's continue right. to do that and then the question is just do we want to I mean, we could just leave Zoom open and open gather and let people go where they want to go, I guess. I like that. Okay. And see what happens. Yeah. yeah. As, I, as I said before, that's the most most similar to what we do uh, for uh -huh. the in-person ones. The, 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 the only thing is, like, if I hadn't had set, have said anything, I don't know whether I should have, if I hadn't have said anything, 70 people would have stayed there, you know, to listen to the discussion, which is fine. Right. But... I don't know whether that's 
that that you know will will lead to fatigue. I think. Yeah, I, I'm trying to think. So, I, think so, did, I think you did the right thing, Tom. I, I think we should have. We, we can go five to 10 minutes over if there are questions. And then I think there should be an end and the end of recording end. is also right. the moment of like, mm -hmm. it's done. You can yeah. stay, but it's done. And I, I think that's important psychologically that so the student, yeah, I think so. this is only day one, you know, there's, there's 19 right. more after today. Exactly. So. Yeah. Okay. And Ethan, are you always going to get people back from gather town or do we at, the, at any point need to, because I have no idea how to, Communicate to everyone in Galaxy. Yeah, I, I passed this along to Ethan. So you, you made all four of us um, able to broadcast. Is that so right? I, from Tom and Veronica, I need the, the email addresses that you used uh, to sign up for Gather. So if you send me those, I, I will give you moderator permission on there. And then you can you click on your own name on the left and you should see get an option to spotlight yourself and that will let you broadcast to the entire Gather. Okay. So you, you can do that at the end to, to remind people to come back. Okay. You know, it would be awesome, Ethan, if, if you could just like turn off and on, like flash the lights and gather off and on a couple of times. Uh -huh, uh -huh, that's what we do uh -huh. in real life. And that, uh -huh. that would really get everyone's attention. Yeah, I should, I should see if I can yes, add an, I'd like an object, like a bell that I can ring or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If it, if it was something like flash and bell, that, that might be good enough. We don't even have to uh -huh. spotlight ourselves. I, I think you, you can also add like a microphone at the center of the room that if you go there, you talk to everyone. <laughs> Anyone can talk to anyone, everyone, but you know. You can do that. I, I, I didn't do that because I, I worried about people sort of stumbling across it accidentally and, and broadcasting uh, to everyone, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. that is an option. <laughs> what did Patrick say about his expectations for the rest of today? Like, was he going to do this for a certain number of minutes? And He's going to yeah. come back. Oh, um, he said 15 minutes. I think that was going to come back at 10 past. OK. Maybe there's five minutes left or even less because he probably yeah, it depends. Yeah, he yeah. was going to come back if people are ready or fast with the worksheet, then he might reunite. But otherwise yeah. it, it might be just a few words, I guess, and then <sighs> this is good actually. I like this. <laughs> so Tom, while you're here, sorry, this is just a direct question to, to Tom. Uh, are you do you want to chair the mornings or should I chair? Yeah, so I thought today we just uh you know, I try to go as much as possible, but yeah, the mornings is better. So I really, I think I won't be able to do any, um, uh, any of the last uh, lecture slot. So do you uh, want to then? Should we just split by default? You do the mornings, and I do the last two, and you do the you do the last. Yeah, I think that's a good okay. idea. Uh, and we can do that for the whole time. Uh, and if you need to switch, and if I need to switch, we can discuss. Good. And for the locals, I should just warn you, sometimes my connection goes off. So <laughs> if I look like I'm not there, <laughs> you should be somehow a timekeeper. I'm hoping one doesn't need to timekeep. Um, yeah, well, when, if, if ever one or the other of you is like not able to be there, we, the local people can, can step in for those things. Okay. Yeah. Amazing. So I think in terms of time zone, it also makes sense for, us to split it that way and um yeah and i, I well it's yeah. nice that we're both doing something each day so that the students mm. can mm. that's true we, yes, yes. we, do, we don't usually get way. both organizers in attendance on the same day when it's on the same day yeah well the first day you know <laughs> um but yeah but i won't i i won't be able to make uh Mukun's talk uh, lectures so I already told you. Yeah. Well, I know you were looking forward to learning about ADS CFT for the first time. <laughs> 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 well, good guys. I feel like things are off to a pretty good start, actually. It's got some yeah. speakers oh, and a lot, lot of good yeah. questions. Yeah. So I'm really feeling nice. good about uh, it. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy with the, the questions. It's, it seems good. Mm -hmm. I feel like. I, just, I feel like students are just more hap happy, happier to ask questions over Zoom than in real life. There seems to be a slightly less intimidation barrier of, of asking that question. So I'm glad to see it. I would be giving Patrick a five minute warning right now. <laughs> well, I, maybe we should, let's see. Do I even know how to enter a breakout room?
Like he's made it to room four. Click on breakout. You click on more and then breakout rooms, or yeah, just breakout rooms. Yeah, I have. So I have it. How do I go there? Um, I think you uh, just the there's, there's a join. If if you see oh, the yeah, list, just, the join. Yeah. Okay, Patrick is in room four. All right. I can go tell him unless one of you would rather. Oh. Uh, um. Oh, you are not joined, Tom. I'm not you, joined. Yeah. You, you should. Were he was invited. Should I? <laughs> he was just auto invited. I'll go let oh, him Pat know. Oh, look at this. Patrick Hayden's iPad has been joined. To him, but anyway, okay. Here we go. I'm gonna go. Shanta has also not joined. Alex has not joined. Let's see what happens if one goes there. Okay, I should go somewhere else. All right, I let Patrick know. We'll just wait for everyone to come back. It seems that some people are squeezing every ounce of time or every every second they can to, to finish the worksheet. All right. So I think we've come to the end of our hour and 15 minutes. I hope that was interesting. We'll discuss, uh, I'll discuss the solution of the worksheet at the, uh, the beginning of the next lecture. And um, as predicted, I think I just had a little bit more material than, than fit into, into the hour. So we'll talk about distance measures next day. That actually fits nicely with the discussion of entropic functions. Uh, and so that is it for today, but I will join you at GatherTown. I don't know if somebody wants to post the, uh, the URL. It it's posted. Oh no, that's old, right? Um, it it is posted in the Slack general channel. Uh, it's in the Slack there, yeah. but I will uh, I'll put it here too. We could yeah. we could also Patrick we could take a couple of uh, questions here on Zoom that will be recorded along with the rest of the lecture. Um, if anyone has any before we head over to gather. Okay, we'll sure. More informal chat. Yeah, and if anyone wants to ask any questions about the worksheet, that that's fine. Uh, you know. Um, I won't formally give you the answer at this point, since I guess we're, we're out, of the yeah, out of the lecture, but feel free to ask me, especially if some of the language, especially part C, you know, it, it's counterfactual and uh, slightly ill-posed. You know, it's more of a thought experiment. And so feel, you know, if you're not sure what I'm asking, feel free to ask me now uh, for clarification. Yeah, so any questions at the moment? What are you asking? <laughs> <laughs> what am I asking in C? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, 
so I'm I'm hypothesizing, right, that when uh, that every every different mixture of quantum states with different weights of probabilities among those quantum states is uh, is somehow distinguishable by measurements, right? So that there, there's some measurement that you can perform. You know, that like say you had the equal mixture up down and the equal mixture left right that there is some measurement that would have different outcome probabilities for those uh, for those two preparations. Now, quantum mechanics is not like that, um, but part C is, you know, it's a counterfactual. I'm saying, imagine that were the case. Um, how would that lead to superluminal signaling? And so the, the, you know, the, the flip side of this is what I'm, what I'm asking you to explore is why is ensemble ambiguity crucial for the consistency of quantum mechanics with relativity, right? That if you did not have this ensemble ambiguity, then quantum mechanics, yeah, you could not you could not marry quantum mechanics and relativity because measurements in one location would instantaneously cause effects elsewhere. Uh, so that's what's being asked in C. Um, how can you use uh, how could you use the fact that Alice measure Alice's measurements from parts A and part B lead to different ensembles to B to communicate superluminally? Um, is that so that I answer the question of what I'm asking? I'll have to think about it. <laughs> okay. Um, just a clarification question. Ensemble sure. ambiguity is like, as I think about it, it's just uh, invariance under change of basis, right? That's what you mean. No, no, what I mean, the ensemble ambiguity is that for any given density operator, there are many different state preparations, right? So you can think of, uh, probability distributions over pure states that will have the same density operator. Like the example I was giving before, the equal mixture of up and down um, will have the same density operator as the equal mix mixture of left and right. Mm -hmm. um, so there's no way for, you know, if somebody prepare, you know, those are two different preparations of quantum states, but if you, but if I prepare a system, either according to pre you know, preparation A, which is equal mixture of up and down, or preparation B, which is equal mix mixture of left and right, and then I hand it to you. There's just no way for you to tell what I've done. But it's so, just there are little basis change of basis, right? The two oh, but, the, but there's more to it than change of basis because another preparation that would have been equivalent would have been the uniform distribution over, say, an equator of the sphere. Um, mm -hmm. That would also have been perfectly fine. Um, or the uni uniform distribution over two latitudes, yeah, you know, one thirty degrees north and one thirty degrees south. That would also have given me, you know, so that there's an there's an infinite number of ways of different uh, ways of doing it. It's not just basis independence. It's actually yeah, it, it's it's more ambiguous than that. Um, and the basis independence is that that's that only really comes into play in the case of this maximally mixed state because there's a degeneracy in the eigenvalues. But for any mixed state, um, even if the eigenvalues are are uh, are non-degenerate, there's still this infinite ambiguity uh, for the ensemble. Like I could give you a characterization of all the different state preparations that would be consistent. You know, like it's known how to do that. But the the point is, there's there's a continue. You know, there's a continuous family of them. Um, yeah. Sorry, so, did you have a good reference for that? Or um, yeah, sure. Uh, actually, if you go into just look at the the Presco lecture notes. Um, there's a discussion of ensemble ambiguity, and the theorem is the Houston Joseph Wooders theorem. And he he discusses it in there. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Are there any more? Is there another quick question? Okay. Um, if not, then I think let's head over to Gather. I think Patrick's going to do that. Yeah, I'll join you there. Um, and the next talk will be on ADS CFT Mukund at uh, 3.45, right? Uh, yes, 3.45. Do we know? All right, thanks, everyone. Calendar?